<laughs> Welcome everybody to class four of Practical Prayer. I'm Panina Taylor, in case you didn't know, because you've been with me all already. If this is your first time uh, watching one of these sections, this is class number four, so you want to go back to the beginning and start with number one. We are in the middle of talking about the Shmona Esrei, the prayer whose name is 18, or also called the Amidah, the uh, standing prayer. And last week we talked about some of what I call the protocols of the um, Shemona Esrei, things like when we bow and, and which way we face and how we stand and things like that. And um, now we're actually going to go through it. But before we do, I just wanted to say one last thing that I didn't get to last week. And that is, I want to talk a little bit about the Kedusha. Now we're going to get into more detail of what the Kedusha is when we actually go through, but um, first of all, the wording of the Kedusha, the Kedusha is a section that is done in the Shrona Esrei when you are praying with a minion, and the Chazan does the repetition. It's part of the repetition of the, the Chazan's repetition of the Shmona Esrei. So for people who only go to shul on Shabbat, that's the only time that you're going to encounter the Kedusha. Um, for men who go to shul every morning, hopefully, uh, they, have, they have this, they encounter this every day. Okay, so first of all, you need to understand that the wording of the Kedusha is different in each Nusach. Remember, we talked about Nusachs and the fact that um, you have Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Sfard, which are the two Ashkenazi uh, Nusachs or versions. And then you have Edot HaMizrach or Nusach Sfaredi. You need to understand that there is, uh, this is probably one of the biggest differences between the Nusachs, is the wording and the, the biggest difference between Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Sfard is the wording in the Kedusha. But if you're davening from a sitter in your own nusach, and it's different from the one that the leader is davening, you just say the kedusha that's in your sitter, okay? So the kedusha is found during the Shmona Esrei, during the first section, after the third bracha. The kedusha is recited only in the presence of a minion, and we're going to look at this in just a second, because I'm going to open up my sitter, and we're going to walk through the Shemona Esrei, okay? So if you're lost, don't worry about it, but I just wanted to get this in, because I was supposed to have this, I was supposed to talk about this at the end of the last class, okay? So if you're dominating at home, you skip the kedusha. We don't say it during our own first time through the Shemona Esrei, even when we're in a minion. It's only done during the Chazan's repetition. So we stand during the Kedusha, even though during the repetition, most of it we're allowed to sit, during the Kedusha we stand, just like we did when we were praying the Shemona Esrei with both feet together, and um, the Kedusha is recited responsively. That means that the congregation says the first line, and then the Chazan repeats that line, and this is the procedure for the whole Kedusha. During the line, Kadosh, 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 we rise on our toes three times, each one with each kadosh. We also rise on our toes when saying the word baruch in the sentence that begins baruch kivod. And then the final time we rise on our toes is during the word yimloch. Now, like I said, if you're confused, if you're lost, don't worry about it, because now what we're going to do is we're going to actually walk through the Shemona Esrei, all right? We, uh, last time we talked about the practical things, and now we're going to walk through the Shemona Esrei to get a real feel for it, so that when you pray the Shemona Esrei, it will hopefully be more meaningful for you. Uh, but before we launch, launch back into the Shemona Esrei itself, I want to say just a little bit more about prayer. Now, in Judaism, it's taught that there are three components to prayer. Praise of Hashem, which is called Shevach, requests, which are Bakashot, and Thanksgiving, which is Hoda'ah. Prayer is not considered truly prayer unless it contains all three of these components. Since the Shemona Esrei is supposed to, in its essence, fulfill one's obligation to prayer, it embodies all three of these components. Now, if you'll recall from our last class, Shemona Esrei means 18, and it was named this because it was originally composed of 18 prayers, which are divided into three sections. Also, as I mentioned in our last class, the prayer now contains 19 blessings because one was added, but the name has remained 18 because, well, things seldom change in Judaism, and as you probably already know. 
However, as we're going to see today, there's actually 21 brachas, not 19, in the Shimona Esrei. But the last two are kind of like these unofficially official but not official prayers. I mean, they're part of the Shimona Esrei, but they're kind of like after the Shimona Esrei. So you'll see when we get to it. Anyway, so the Shemona Esrei was designed to fulfill our obligation to pray. And when the Gemara speaks of tefillah, prayer, it's the Shemona Esrei that it's referring to. The Shabbat and festival Shemona Esrei is different from the weekday Shemona Esrei, even though it's divided also into three sections. The middle section, which is really funny because the middle section on Shabbat and holidays has fewer prayers, but it's much longer. So, but for now, we're not going to go through the Shabbat and holiday Shemona Esrei, we're only going through the weekday Shemona Esrei, since that's the one that you pray the most often. All right, the section, the three sections of the Shemona Esrei correspond to the three different components of prayer. The first section is comprised of the first three blessings and is pretty much always the same. The variations for Shabbat and holidays is really quite minor. And these first three blessings are blessings of praise because, as we mentioned before, one should always begin an encounter with God by praising Him. In order to be able to ask God for anything, in fact, in order to connect with God in the first place, we have to know who God is, right? Who Hashem is, who it is that we're praying to. Why are we asking Him for anything, right? So beginning prayer with praise kind of brings all of this into focus. How can a person pray to a God they don't believe in? I mean, of course, it's possible to offer up a prayer in the hopes that this unknown being will receive those prayers anyway. But really, to access that connection with the divine and the power to create the new reality that the prayer is requesting, and more on that in a minute, uh, we must first focus on who it is that we're praying to and how it is that this is being, that this being has the ability to even answer those prayers, okay? So the first section is about praise to God. On weekdays, the middle section of the Amidah consists of 13 blessings that are individual and communal requests to God. Of these 13 requests recited during the weekday Amidah, the first five are essentially personal, okay? They're individual requests to God to improve the situation of each person. The following eight blessings are focused more explicitly on the communal and national needs of the Jewish people. Since the sages expected the Shemona Esrei not just to be a, a be-all and end-all of prayer, but rather to spur us on to personal prayer, they expressed that a person should insert their own personal prayers during this middle section of the Shemona Esrei. They instructed that personal prayers may be interjected anywhere in the middle section, but that prayer uttered should correspond to the prayer expressed in that specific bracha. And I will explain exactly what I mean in just a minute. Although the prayers for a person who is ill, for example, should be offered with the bracha that begins, uh, Rifa Enu, heal us, Hashem, any prayer may be expressed within the prayer that ends, Shomea Tefillah. Again, We'll actually look at it together in just a minute, but the prayer that ends Shomea Tfilah is an all-encompassing expression that God hears all of our prayers. The way this is done is that each bracha isn't just a line, but more like a paragraph. So we recite the corresponding paragraph, and then just before the last line, the one that begins with Baruch Ata Hashem, and again, you'll see in a second, uh, we insert the prayer or prayers in any language, and then we finish the last line. In this case, Baruch Ata Hashem Shomea Tfila. The last section, and again, we're going to spend the bulk of this class going through that, so just hang on and don't worry about that. The last section concludes blessings of thanksgiving to God. Like the first three blessings, these are identical for weekday and Shabbat. So the only thing that significantly changes between the weekday Shemona Esrei, the Shabbat, and holiday Shemona Esrei is that middle section. And it does change substantively between the weekday and Shabbat, okay? But the beginning section and the ending section are exactly the same, okay? They are identical except for a couple of words that are changed. Uh, they're identical to the weekday version of the Amidah. 
Concluding our prayer with giving thanks to God is a way of expressing our complete faith in God that he will answer our prayers. And in this way, we are creating a vessel to receive the answered prayer that we have requested. Now, as I mentioned in previous classes, the Torah tells us that we are created in God's image. And one understanding of what that means is that just as Hashem created the world, we create, right? And just as he created the world through his words, we create reality through our words. Therefore, a great emphasis is placed in Judaism on the power of our words. If we understand that our words have the power to alter reality, or rather to create a new reality, then prayer, even though it's phrased in the form of a request, is really us speaking the new reality that we want to create. But our power to create doesn't come from us, it comes from God, from the godly spark that is within us. And so when we thank God for answering our prayers, what we're really saying is thank you for endowing my words with the power to create this new reality. We're making the space for the new reality to take form. And so we end our prayer, and we should end all prayer, whether it's formalized prayer or hitbodedut, the individual unstructured prayer, with thanksgiving to God for answering our prayers and giving them the power to become reality. Okay, so let's walk through the Shemona Esrei now. Now understand that we could do a whole year course just on going through the Shemona Esrei, and clearly we don't have time to do that. So I highly recommend not just reading through the Shemona Esrei, but there's a really excellent book on the Shemona Esrei written by Rabbi Zev Leth, who goes through each and every word in the Shemona Esrei. I don't have the book here at my desk, but it's like this thick. It's really big book, very, very detailed. I highly, highly recommend it. It's called Shmon Esrei, and it's by Rabbi, Rabbi Zev Leff, L-E-F-F. -F. And it's a very meaningful book, and it will really change how you understand the Shmon Esrei if you get this book. So, all right, everybody open your sitter to the Shacharit Shmona Esrei. All right, it's going to be after the Shema. Okay, Shmon Esrei. I, I don't know if you can see this, but it says Shmon Esrei at the top. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a, a second or two to find the Shmon Esrei, the Shmon Esrei in your sitter. Um, you know, obviously, if you're watching by video, you can pause. The people in the group or not don't have that luxury, so I'm going to give you guys a few minutes to um, to find the Shmon Esrei in your sitter. As we discussed in the last class, the, we start the Shemona Esrei by physically entering the presence of Hashem, by taking three steps backwards and three steps forward. Now, in my regular class, I stood up and I showed the students, so you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination and work with me here, but um, we start by physically, we take three steps forward, and we are creating this, this vision of us entering the throne room of God, all right? And it's very, very important because the Shemona Esrei is supposed to be said with tremendous kavana, with, with uh, concentration and focus. Um, and if you're focusing on God, you've got to put away all of the outside distractions. And so by physically taking three steps forward, you are doing an action that will help you to put your head in the right place, all right? All right, so now, if you look in your sitter, if you have a, an art scroll sitter, it's really convenient because everything is so well labeled. But you will notice that at the very top of the first bracha, okay, it says avot. It says fathers. Now, before that, there is a small line here that says Hashem Svatai tiftach ufi yagid tehilatacha. God, open my lips that my mouth shall declare your praise. All right? But the Shmona Esrei actually begins, this is just like a kind of a preface, if you will, that we say before we actually start the Shmona Esrei. Shmona Esrei starts with this bracha. You will notice that this first section is called a vote, fathers. 
The reason for this is that, well, quite frankly, as a nation, we've messed up, right? I mean, we were given all sorts of promises from Hashem as to what life would be like if we followed his commandments and walked in his ways. Throughout the generations, we've done better and worse at fulfilling the commandments. But as a whole, well, we're kind of in trouble. So who are we to make any requests from Hashem? I mean, Hashem created us and that's why. But the idea is to acknowledge with humility that... Um, that all of the promises that God fulfills are not because we deserve them so much as because he made a promise to our forefathers. And so even though God would certainly be justified in totally abandoning us, he doesn't. And he doesn't because of his faithfulness to the fathers. So as hard as our history has been, it has also been clear that Hashem has protected and kept us. And we can only understand this in the context of the promises that he made to our forefathers, specifically Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. So we begin the prayers by invoking the promises Hashem made to our forefathers, that he would be faithful even when we ourselves are unworthy. Now remember I mentioned the fact that we start with praise because we have to first recognize who Hashem is in order to connect with him. The first thing we have to understand is that God is faithful beyond all human comprehension. He made a promise to our forefathers and he stays true to those promises in spite of our lack. At the end of the first blessing, we bow. Now, you see it says, Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Veloke Avoteinu Eloke Avraham, Eloke Yitzchak, the Eloke Yaakov, Hakel Hagadova, Hagiborva, Hanarakel, Elion, Gomel Hasadim Tovim, Vikane Akol, Vizoher Hazde Avot, Umevi, Goel, Livne, Livne, Benehem, I'm reading this sideways, so bear with me. Benehem, Lamanchimobi Ahava, and then Melech Ozer, Umashia, Umagain, and then we have the Bracha. Baruch Atah Hashem Magen Avraham. Okay, we bow at this Baruch Atah Hashem Magen Avraham. Um, Ashkenazim bend the knee at Baruch, and then bend the body at Atah, and rise up with Hashem. Sephardim do not bend the knee, but bow at Baruch, hold at Atah, and arise at Hashem. Okay? Did everybody get that so far? So that is the first blessing in the first section. And we start the Shimon Esrei, if you will, with a bow. We do not bow every time Hashem's name is said, or, or there's a bracha. We only bow four times five if you count the very end, okay? The second blessing, and it's interesting, I don't know if you can see this in the camera, but I numbered each of the blessings. So the second blessing has a little two there. The second blessing is called Gevurot, strength or might. Whereas the first bracha is associated with Avraham, who is the first of the forefathers, and the first one to receive the promise from Hashem for his descendants, this bracha is associated with Yitzchak, Isaac, who represents the attribute of Gevura, of strength and self-control, which was clearly exhibited when he willingly allowed himself to be bound on the altar to be sacrificed by his father, which we all know um, didn't happen. But interestingly, this bracha ends with the phrase, who revives the dead. Traditional t tradition tells us that Abraham was going to willingly sacrifice his son, but only because he believed that God would resurrect him afterwards, since he was the heir of promise, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. God said that, that it was through Isaac that Abraham would inhabit the earth, you know, his generations would come after him. You know, it didn't make sense to him that God would kill the one who was supposed to bring this to fruition. And so he understood that, um, that if God really asked him to kill his son, that he would resurrect him afterwards. 
All right. It's also said that this is what the angel said when Yitzchak was restored to life at the Akeda, when when he was not sacrificed. Okay, when he survived. An important piece of information for this bracha is that it is in this bracha that we mention that Hashem gives us rain during the winter or dew during the summer. So why do we mention this prayer during Gvorot? By the way, you may notice. Okay, if you're looking, see how there's a line and it says for winter and for summer, right? So we meant to, when we mention rain in the winter and we mention dew in the summer because it doesn't rain in Israel during the summer at all. This past year we had we've had some very strange weather. It rained a lot later than usual. Usually, after uh, Pesach it stops raining um, for the most part. Certainly by a few weeks after Pesach, it completely stops raining and it doesn't rain a drop again until the fall in Israel. In fact, you could move your entire household of furniture out to the front porch and live outside in Israel during the summer and you would not have to worry about your furniture ever getting wet. Uh, and which is why if you've ever been to Israel, you know that they do a lot of uh, weddings, summer weddings in Israel outside. In fact, we have quite a lot. And, um, you know, in America, there would always be the concern that it would rain. But in Israel, there's no concern of rain because during the summer, we don't get rain. So we don't mention rain during the summer. Uh, and we actually don't want them. There are some crops that, that while they need to be watered, they actually don't do well with summer rains. So this is a unique thing to Israel. But anyway, so why do we mention this during the prayer of Givurot? Because it's understood that one of the greatest manifestations of God's power is related to the rain process, right? Hashem says that if we follow his commandments, we will get rain in its season. Also, rain and dew, which have a spiritual equivalent, are related to the concept of resurrection. And so it was deemed to be the appropriate place to put it to put in this piece, this prayer. All right. Now that we are after Sukkot, that's the time that we're doing this class. If you're watching this class at a different time of year, well, it doesn't apply, but uh, we have changed over to the prayer for rain. And so we say, Mashiv Haruach Umurid Hageshem. Okay. So that's during the, the summer, we say Murid Hatal, who brings down the dew. But because we are now in the winter, we say Mashiv Haruach Umarid Hageshem, who makes the wind blow and causes the rain to descend. And we will say this in every Shemona Esrei until Passover. All right. The third blessing is called Kedushat Hashem. All right. You may notice between the second and third, and we'll go over this in a little bit. Uh, it has, there's the Kedusha, okay? And then the third bracha, here we go. It says, the holiness of God's name, Kedushat Hashem, okay? This blessing is associated with Yaakov, who is said to embody the attribute of holiness. Now, you will notice that in your sitter, most likely between the second and the third bracha, like I said, is the Kedusha, okay? And it's sectioned off, and it's labeled the Kedusha, which means sanctification. This is an additional piece that's added during the Chazan's repetition of the Amida when there is a minion present. As I said at the beginning of the class, if you're davening on your own or not with a minion, this part is skipped. It's said that when there is a minion present, the group of 10 men represent the nation as a whole, which is why it's important for every community, and in fact, every Jewish man, to have a minion to pray in, since, if you'll recall from our first class, the obligation to pray the formal prayers substitute for the obligation to bring sacrifices on behalf of the nation. The reason the Kedusha is said during the repetition when there is a minion is because they are echoing the angels who sing God's praises by proclaiming his holiness and his glory. Last class, if you'll recall, 
we went over how we stand and rise on our toes. Actually, I did it at the beginning of this class during the words kadosh, 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 yamloch, and baruch. But when you are on your own, you skip the kadusha and you go directly to the third bracha, kadushat Hashem. Those three blessings comprise the first section of the Shemona Esrei called the Avot, because their association with the three Avot, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And that is also the section of, that is also the uh, section, the praise, the Shavach section, or the praise section of um, the Amida. Okay. Just want to see if there's anything else I need to mention here. If anybody has a question on this section, let me know. All right. All right. I think that's it. All right. Now, number four is called Bina Insight. We're moving on to the middle section which in the weekday Shemona Esrei is comprised of 13 blessings of request or bakashot. All right, now we move on to the middle section, which in the weekday Shemona Esrei is comprised of 13 blessings of request or bakashot. And remember, it's during this section that we insert personal prayers. It's preferable to insert them at the appropriate place. So I recommend that if you're keeping a list of prayer requests, that you go through and list them according to the order of these prayers. So what do I mean? Well, the first blessing of Bakashot is called Bina, insight, all right? And the prayer says, you graciously endow man with knowledge and teach to the frail mortal insight. Endow us graciously, with your, uh, endow us graciously from yourself with wisdom insight and knowledge. Blessed are you, Hashem, gracious giver of wisdom. So let's say that you're praying for clarity concerning a job offer or a marriage proposal for that matter. You need insight. You have a decision to make that will affect the rest of your life. This would be a good place to insert, insert such a prayer. And it doesn't have to be only about you. It could be that if you're praying for somebody else to have that insight. So how do you do it? Well, first you say the first part, but you stop before the bracha. So if you're looking here, right, you have the first part, which says, Atachonein, you graciously endow man with uh, knowledge and teach to a frail mortal insight. Endow us graciously from yourself with wisdom, insight, and knowledge. And then you see, blessed, right, Baruch. So you say that first part, you stop and you say your personal prayer, whether you're praying for somebody else or praying for yourself, Hashem, please give me insight into which job I should take or which person I should marry or should I say yes or shouldn't I say yes or whatever. If you're praying for another person, it's always a good idea to say their Hebrew name with the name of their mother. When we're praying for, um, for somebody, we use the name of their mother. And um, if you are praying for somebody who is not Jewish or doesn't have a Hebrew name, as far as you know, totally fine to use their English name. Completely okay. You can pray for some, anybody using whatever name that you know them by. That's fine. So you ask for the clarity that you seek, and then you finish with Baruch, Baruch Ata Hashem Chonein Hadak. All right? So that's the same method that you're going to use with all of these prayers in the middle section, which are bakashot, which are requests. You read the first part. You stop before you get to the baruch. You say the prayer that you want to say quietly to yourself, because in the Shemona Esrei, only we hear ourselves. Um, if you're praying for somebody else, pray for them by name. If they have a Hebrew name and you know it, pray for them by their Hebrew name. If they don't, that's fine. You can just pray for them by their, their English or Spanish or whatever name. And then you finish up with the bracha. All right, does that make sense? Okay, that is, um, that was prayer number four. Prayer number five is about repentance. Okay, so if you need help repenting about something or know somebody who needs help repenting, again, you read the first line of the prayer 
Then you stop and say the personal prayer that you have. And then you finish with Baruch Atah Hashem Harotzeh Bichuva, okay? Who wants, who desires uh, repentance, okay? Here we are at the weekday Shacharit Amida. all right? And the first section is called the Patriarchs, which we already went through. There's the, okay, so wait a minute. A vote. Let's see if I can find this for you. Hang on a second. Gevura. Okay, a vote, right? So that's the very beginning. You see the weekday shacharit, they're calling it the patriarchs. That's the first of the 19 brachot. Then you have divine might. I said was Gevura. That's the second. Okay, then you have the holiness of God, that's the third bracha, that's the Kedusha, or it's followed by the Kedusha, which they show here, okay? Right, where we rise on our toes is Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is full of his glory, okay? And now, what did I say? We were on Bina. Right, actually, that was number four was Bina, and here you see the bracha, Ata chonen la adam daat, um lamed le enosh bina. You graciously favor man with knowledge and teach mortals understanding. All right, so there's a note here, but um, if there wasn't a note there with, of explanation. You would stop after that first line, You graciously favor man with knowledge and teach mortals understanding. And then you say the personal prayer that you want to put into that section about insight. Okay. And then you say the Baruch part, which is just interesting the way that they divided this up. Baruch atah Hashem chonen hada'at. Okay. So that is number four. And number five is repentance. So it says here, Hashivenu avinu le Torah-techa. I'm having a hard time reading my computer screen, so forgive me for that. Return us, our Father, to your Torah and draw us near our King to your service. Cause us to return to you in perfect repentance before your face, right? And that is Lifanacha, that's right here. And then it says, Baruch Ata Hashem Harotzeh And again, you would say the first line. I don't know if you guys can see my pointer as I'm going across here. Hopefully you can. And then you stop, you say whatever personal prayer is appropriate right there. And then you finish with Baruch Atah Hashem Harotzeh B'Tishuvah. Okay, so let me just check and see. I want to check and see if there was any more chat. Okay. Ah, okay, you just grabbed the wrong one. Okay, so now I'm going to unshare as we continue. Actually, maybe I should leave it up. I don't know if you find this helpful or not uh, to have this screen shared. All right, the next bracha, number six, is forgiveness. And this would be a good time not only to pray for forgiveness for something you've done. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because there's too much of a mess on my computer. Sorry about that. Okay, so number six is forgiveness. All right, and this one, let me just hold it up so that you can see. All right. It says forgiveness here. And it says, forgive us, Father, for we have erred. Now, I didn't write this in my notes, but you should know the instructions are that we strike the left side of the, our chest with our right fist while reciting the words chatanu, we have sinned, 
We have erred and Pashanu. We have willfully sinned. Okay, so we say, forgive us our father, for we have erred, and pardon us our king, for we have willfully sinned. For God, for the God who is good and forgiving are you. And then it ends here. Let me bring this closer. Um, and then are you, and then it says, Baruch Ata Hashem, Hanun Hamarbe Lisloach. Okay, so again, this is what we're going to do with each of these. You don't have to insert a personal prayer with each prayer. I mean, you don't have to put any personal prayer in here. You can dab in the Shemona Esrei and pray your personal Hidbodadud at a completely separate time. But if you find it meaningful, you can insert personal prayers during your recitation of the Shemona Esrei, and this is the way that you do it. Okay, this is where you do it. So we have these 13 different prayers that are covering a wide variety of topics of things that we might need prayer for. And it's really great if you insert personalized prayers during that time and can connect it. But as you'll see in just a minute, the last prayer of this section is really a catch-all prayer. So you could also just get to that and pray all of your private prayer, personal prayers, especially prayers for others at that time, and just do that. So there's a lot of variety there. It's just that the rabbis, when they set the system up, they didn't want it to be like, okay, you have to do it this way. And there's like no room for you to express yourself and to pray for those things that are on your heart and for those, for those that need prayer. All right. So number six was about forgiveness so obviously if you are needing forgiveness then uh, that would be a good time to pray for that forgiveness for something that you've done but also to ask for divine help in forgiving someone that perhaps you've had a hard time forgiving okay so that's a good good place to kind of launch off into that type of prayer Number seven is redemption. And here we're asking for Hashem to send Mashiach. But you could also ask for a personal redemption here. All right? And I'll leave that up to you as to what that means. Number eight is for healing. Now, obviously, this is where you would pray for all of those who need healing. This is why I say that it's, it's a good idea. Maybe even, print out, maybe even print out on your computer a list of the titles for each of the 13 middle section prayers. Like, you know redemption, healing, and then when you get prayer requests for people or you have prayer requests of your own, you can just go in and fill in what goes in each category and then you could print that off and use that when you're praying, all right? So number eight is healing and this is where you're going to pray for those who need healing. Number nine is a prayer for the year of prosperity, for a year of prosperity. And here again, we mention rain and dew. But this time we're asking for the rain and dew to be given appropriately rather than mentioning it as a part of God's might. Okay, so the first time we mentioned it, it was in reference to God's might. And here now we are mentioning it, um, asking for it to be given in the right amounts at the right time, which as I mentioned earlier in Israel, we are keenly aware of the importance of rain in the right amounts and at the right time of year. You know, during the summer, if we had rain, we could end up with landslides, we could end up with crops being drowned. I mean, there's just like all kinds of problems in Israel if you have rain at the wrong time of year. And at the same time, if we don't have rain during the winter, then our crops for sure will die. So that's also like really, really important. All right, so number 10 is the ingathering of the exiles. If you're praying for someone to be able to make Aliyah, for example, this might be a good place to pray it, okay? Number 11 is the restoration of justice. And if you're waiting for justice, that might be a good place to put it. Number 12 is the prayer which was added during the time of Rabban Gamliel II, shortly after the destruction of the Second Temple. This is what makes our 18 prayer, prayer 19 prayers, okay? It was composed in response to the threats of early Christians and other heretics who would use all sorts of methods to get Jews to go astray, including reporting on them to the Roman government. All right, 
Number 13 is about the righteous ones. Number 14 is a request to rebuild Jerusalem. Number 15 is the Davidic reign, which is really another prayer for redemption of the Mashiach. Number 16. 16 is the last of the middle section prayers, often called Shema Koleinu, and it is asking Hashem to accept our prayers. And it's here that we can insert any other prayers, even if we didn't have a category, or we can insert all of them. And some people, like I said, have this custom to simply pray all of their personal prayers here. Okay? So that's totally okay also. You can simply, you know, bring your list of prayers. And when you get to this prayer, you can add them there. All right. Let me actually turn to it so you can see it in my sitter. Okay, in the art scroll, it's labeled as acceptance of prayer, and it starts with the words Av Harachman, which is Father who is merciful, and it ends with Shomea Tfilah. So you would say everything up to the Baruch, right? You stop before Baruch, then you say all of your personal prayers that you want to say there, and then you end with Baruch Ata Hashem Shomea Tfilah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God who Here's prayer. All right. The third section of the Shemona Esrei begins with a blessing called Avodah, divine service. And it seems appropriate that as we approach the end of the Shemona Esrei, we ask Hashem to want us and our prayers and to return us, turn, return to us his full service with the rebuilding of the Beit Migdash, the temple, and the resumption of the sacrifices. And while it may not feel like this is part of the Thanksgiving section, it is the segue to the next one. Prayer number 18 is called Modim, Thanksgiving. Okay, here you see Modim. All right, Thanksgiving. And here we bow a long bow at the beginning without bending our knees, whether it's Sephardi or Ashkenazi, this bow is done from the waist, not with bowing from the knees, and we bow at the waist at the word modim, and we rise at the word Hashem. So you might notice, if you're looking in your sitter, that that's pretty long. Modim anachnu lach, jatahu Hashem. So we go down on modim anachnu lach, jatahu Hashem. Okay, we rise back up at Hashem. Now you will notice here that there is an extra modim okay so you see the modim right and we pray it and when you're doing the shwan esrei uh sorry when we do the repetition we're going to stand for the second modim which if you turn the page in the gray if you're in a minion you're going to see and this is the same in the shabbat shwan esrei as well modim it also starts with modim and nulach it's a little bit different so why are there two different modims well it's called the Modim of the Rabbis because it is composed of some personal declarations of a number of rabbis making the Modim complete. All right, so when you're praying with a minion during the repetition while the Chazan is saying Modim, we say this other Modim to ourselves, all right? And it's just that there was a question about statements by different rabbis and it was added to make that whole section complete, all right? In the last part of the Modim, we bow again as we finish with the last line of this prayer. Blessed are you, Hashem, beneficent. One is your name and is fitting to give you thanks. Okay, so if you are doing just the regular Modim because you're not in a minion, right? Okay, you have this. And then here they have the Modim of the rabbis. And then you have... You have the lines interspersed with stuff here. And you now in mine, of course, there's a note here. You might want to hi highlight it if you have a sitter that does have this note about bowing. And when you get to the very bottom, Baruch Atah Hashem Hato Simcha Vilchal Na'el Lehodot. Blessed are you, Hashem, the Beneficent One is your name. We bend the knee, Baruch Atah Hashem, unless you're Sparty, in which case you just bend at the waist, Baruch Atah Hashem and you finish that bracha, okay? It is 
Blessed are you, Hashem, the Beneficent One is your name, and it is fitting to give you thanks. And now we get to the last bracha of the Shemon Asrei. It starts with the word Sim Shalom, peace. Sounds like a good way to finish, right? We ask Hashem to grant all of Israel peace. During the Chazan's repetition in Israel, just before the last blessing, the Kohanim, the priests, stand up and they give the Kohanic blessing. Here it is done in Israel, it's done every morning. Outside of Israel, it's only done on holidays. All right? Now, technically, that's the end of the Shemona Esra, but it as, isn't actually, as I said at the very beginning, there are two final blessings. They were added to the end, and it has become the custom to say them both, and they are included as if part of the Shemona Esra, even though technically they aren't, and we don't leave the position, we don't back out our three steps until we have finished saying them, and they are simply called the concluding prayers, okay? So the one starts with Elokai, Elohai Nitsur, my God, guard my tongue from evil. I happen to love this particular prayer, and it's very fitting, given the fact that we just used our mouth to create all of this amazing good in the world by praying for people's healing and praying for peace and praying for redemption and praying for insight and praying for all of these different things that we just prayed for. Now we have a paragraph, a concluding paragraph, asking God to guard our tongue, acknowledging that our mouth is very powerful. And on the one hand, we just used it to create all of this amazing good. We don't want to then use it to create bad, to destroy. So this bracha is about our tongue. And then the last bracha here, or the last uh, prayer, is a yehi ratzon, may it be your will, that Hashem would restore Jerusalem and the building of the temple. What an appropriate way to end the Shemona Esrei. So when we finish, okay, actually the interesting thing is, is that we actually back out, sorry, I kind of misinstructed you. Um, we stay in our position during the Elohai. Then when we get to the part of the Elohai that says, Osei Shalom Bim Ramav, okay? You take three steps back, okay? And then you say, Osei Shalom Bim Ramav. You bow left to Osei Shalom Bim Ramav. Then you bow right on Hu Yase Shalom Aleinu. Then you bow forward on Vial Kol Yisrael, Vimru Amen. And most people will stay bowed forward as they take their three steps back. They stand up and they say the Yehi Ratzon. Now, you may notice that many people have the custom of then stepping forward three steps after they stepped back, just like they did at the beginning, and bouncing on their toes. And I've looked for a lot of sources and why people do this. There aren't any. And there are some actual modern, actual modern commentators who say that we shouldn't then take three steps forward again because that represents entering the presence of God. And we just left the throne room of God. Now, we do it backwards because you never turn your back on the king. All right? And we do that when we're leaving the Kotel as well. It used to be in ancient times that nobody would ever turn their back on somebody of uh, respect, even their elders, they would back out of the room. That's a very Eastern thing to do. It's not so much, you know, I mean, not at all in today's modern era. Um, okay, so that's it for today's class on Shemona Esrei. You now have been through the entire weekday Shemona Esrei. And uh, does anybody have any questions before we close class for today? Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a real pleasure having you all in the class. I'm very much enjoying going through the sitter with you. I hope that you're getting a lot out of it. And uh, if you are getting a lot out of it and would consider maybe sending a small donation to uh, a PayPal donation to PaninaTaylor at gmail.com, um, any gift would be appreciated. It helps me to continue to do my work without actually charging anybody, which is what I would like to continue to do to make sure that the information is available to everybody who needs it. So thank you so much again for joining me and I look forward to seeing you and your questions in the Facebook group and I'll see you next week.